I did want to um, ask each one of you if maybe you would share what, what it is that you research uh, and what maybe you're currently working on. Because I think that would be really um, interesting and exciting for all of the participants to hear about. So I don't know if someone's um, willing to start. I'll, I'll go first, get, get it out of the way. Um, I will confess that like even the question like, what do you research like creates some heart palpitations? I'll just own that right now. Like what is it that I research? Um, because I feel like my, and I'm speaking from the perspective of, of an assistant professor, I've not been tenured yet. So that, that you know, creates some additional feelings there. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm sure we'll get into talking later about what research is, um, but preface that by saying. So as, as far as I'm concerned, um, that some of the things that I'm researching are related to representation, diversity and design. Um, but by virtue of my position at Cleveland State, I was hired to help create UX UI curriculum and pick up the web pieces um, that some of my research is actually has actually moved into that area as well. Um, so if I had to find a central point, I would say that it's in pedagogy. Um, kind of everything seems to, to branch out from that as kind of one of the common themes, but certainly diversity, representation, um, even some social impact design things are tangentially related, but um, diversity, pedagogy. Oh, I guess I can also add, if, if, uh, before anyone else jumps in, um, there are two projects I, I will plug. One that I'm working on with um, Audrey Bennett, who teaches at um, University of Michigan, and that's on determining the existence of unconscious bias against scholars, underrepresented ethnically in academia, and that's an ongoing project of yeah, self, like right. people self-reporting their experiences. So I can put in the Slack channel link. We're still trying to collect responses for that. So I will add a link there. And then just a, a project that has become research that just started out of frustration um, with the Mueller report. So we, we now have this project called Ongoing Matter, Democracy, Design, and the Mueller Report, um, which we've gotten research funds to, to help promote. Um, but it's basically we're trying to take sections of the Mueller report and give them more visual, make them more visually dynamic so that more people are interested in like what information is buried in the Mueller report to make that more visually visible. Yeah, so first of all, um, I just want to say that I teach at St. John's University in Queens, New York. Um, so that that gives people a little bit of a context that I am teaching uh, in a university setting. It's a private university. Um, and so I think what would be interesting maybe in terms of what I bring is that I have a traditional MFA, um, but I pretty quickly pivoted into doing something that feels more like research in other disciplines. So traditional forms of scholarship and publishing Though when I started uh, quite a long time ago now, um, there were not so many design journals, so I did do more trade kind of writing. So my research has been around writing about design, research and writing about design. I say that research is the thing that gets me really excited. And then, um, so it's not just like me in my little room thinking, oh, that was really cool. I have to write about it <laughs> so that some other people maybe know about it and can give me feedback on it and stuff like that. So in terms of um, what I'm working on right now, um, I'm about to start working, uh, I think, on a new edition of a previous book. Um, so that'll be interesting. It would be bringing about 30% new content to a book I did a few years ago. But then most of what I've done over the last five years is actually kind of put a pause on some of my own research in terms of um, looking at discrete areas that I was interested in and really tried to help design faculty not reinvent the wheel with research. And so um, when you ask me questions, <laughs> full disclosure, I'll probably be talking about Design Incubation, the organization that I'm part of that helps faculty think about research and writing and creates venues and opportunities for doing that. And so um, that's really where the bulk of my time is spent these days and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear what other people are working on. Thanks. 
And I'm glad that you brought up Design Incubation because I think that's such an important organization doing really, really important work. And I think a lot of us have had connections where we've presented at some of the colloquiums or um, been a fellow, a writing fellow. So, yeah. Yeah, that's my favorite part is it's like old home week almost every place I go now because we've been, we've, been, we've been able to connect with so many people and that's, that's been really wonderful. Yeah. So I bring uh, the administrative side of the spectrum. Um, so I most recently was associate provost at Farmingdale State College, which is part of the State University of New York system. Uh, I've also been an associate dean of the School of Business and a chair of the Department of Visual Communications. So um, I bring some of that experience of what people outside of the design uh, venue are looking for as well as administration. Um, myself this year, I just went back to faculty. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I still have some administrative duties. I am the academic program manager for the college. So I help people develop new programming. Um, but for myself, it's a, it's almost like I'm right back at the beginning again and thinking about what it is that I want to explore and research. Um, I've done a lot of presenting on applied learning uh, because that's something that I was involved with across the campus uh, and it's something that we in the design disciplines do just by nature. Um, and so I've done a lot of trying to bring um, some of those things that we've done at our college to other institutions. Oh, that's great. And I'm so pleased that you um, agreed to join the panel. Um, Eris had actually made the suggestion, which I think was brilliant, because you do bring that, that administrative side. And I think Byrne will have um, some thoughts th about that as well, which I think will be really useful. So thank you. And then last but not least, Byrne, I know you have some really exciting projects in the works. So tell us about what you're working on. Oh, I don't know about that, but we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> so my research covers um, community engagement social justice, um, participatory and project-based learning, and then using, a des using design as the catalyst that provides innovation and entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, and a project that I'm currently working on is called At The Table, which is a physical uh, table uh, where that goes into different communities and helps them um, with either the negative effects of globalization or um, racial or cultural uh, difficulties that they're facing and there's a different kinds of um, um, things that happen so the community is invited and then divided into groups and then they go through um, different prompts. Each group is given a different prompt and then a different technology. So one group has video cameras, another has uh, still cameras, another has uh, video recording, and another has letterpress. And then they go into the community and address our prompt and come back to the table uh, where they eat locally sourced food and then share, um, you know, share what they've learned. And I suppose the idea is sort of like, I don't know if you've seen the show um, Chef's Table. Um, so it's kind of like that. So can food become a catalyst and the prompts become catalysts for people to have those conversations that they would not normally have? And of course, with COVID-19, at the moment, that's gone down the toilet. So that's me. Thank you. Which I also think that brings up a really interesting point and in the, the sort of importance of the kinds of different research that we can do, because now that all of a sudden the situation has changed, how can we think about ways where we might address, you know, that, the fact that we're missing that sense of connection, we're missing that sense of, of social structure and just being able to sit around a table with people um, that aren't in our, you know, immediate family unit. And so, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of new research that can kind of come out of the situation 
um, that we can all address in different ways, which I think is, is also the power of design. But. Um, briefly, um, how do you define design research? Um, and also, how, how is it defined or understood at your institution? Um, and it's okay to say you're not sure because I'm brand new at my institution. We don't have design until I came. So I don't think anyone knows yet. I get to try to uh, create that sense of what design research is and what matters. Um, so um, briefly, uh, what is your definition of design research? And then how is it understood at your institution? And anybody can jump in. So I'm going to ask a, another question. I'm going to add a question on there as opposed to, to, to trying to answer the question simply to say that when I first moved into academia, I had no idea. I wasn't really like I was prepared for the teaching part, but in terms of research and really understanding what was accepted as research, I just had no idea. And even at, so I'm currently at Cleveland State University and one of my senior faculty members, Jen Visaki O'Grady, she, she's a full professor now, but the things that got her tenure and got her promoted, like her path is very different than mine and, and my colleague Sarah Rutherford. And so I think part of why I'm interested in this in having this conversation is to help even fac yeah, faculty who are coming up navigate some of this. Um, and it is tricky because it is different at every institution, right? When I compare sort of the tenure requirements from institution to institution, some include, you know, it's, it's more of a publishing, maybe there's emphasis on publishing, academic publishing, like traditional other, like other areas do traditionally. Um, but some institutions, it's more creative output. So, and then how do you measure it? What does peer review mean? Um, so I don't have all the answers to those questions, but I will say that I think one thing I have, one takeaway for me has been that it is very different from institution to institution. And so knowing those, those um, guidelines and being in conversation with senior faculty in your department program and having mentorship to like navigate some of that becomes really crucial. Um, so that, that's one takeaway. It's like, what is your institution? And then, you know, obviously in some cases where they're just figuring, they're, they're trying to develop that information, that's great that you have some, some power and ownership over what that trajectory looks like, but I think it's constantly changing. I can uh, piggyback on that because I watched that trajectory happen during my time at Farmingdale. So I've been there for almost 20 years now. And when I started, I was supposed to be a practicing designer. Uh, and now that's not what junior faculty are expected to do. And in the interim, it was supposed to be that you would get into uh, how or print or something like that. And now it's moving, the pendulum is swinging even further. And what's interesting is the written standards haven't changed. The unwritten standards change constantly. Um, and I think Anne made a really important, a couple really important points. So one is that every institution is different uh, and you need to learn what your culture is at your institution and what your, the expectations are for you during that process. So, um, you need to know your institution, right? Uh, and the expectations for you in that tenure process in particular. And what we used to do was go to colleagues, senior faculty, and ask them, what do I do? How do I go through this process? Uh, and everything I say to junior faculty now is talk to your chair, talk to your dean, um, if you have the ability to, to interact with your provost and your president in, in any way, shape, or form, I would even have those conversations so that you have an understanding of where your institution is today. Um, because my institution went from a two-year institution to a master's granting institution in the 20 years that, that I was there. So, of course, standards are going to change. Um, but that makes it really difficult for junior faculty. Um, and then the other thing that I would add is in terms of the definition of design research. Uh, in industry, there's one definition of design research. And then in academia, there's a different definition. 
and yet the terminology is interchangeable and that makes it all the more confusing, I think. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you made a really great point too about standards changing, because I think that's happening at um, all sorts of institutions. And I've been teaching now, this is my third institution, my 10th year, um, and they've all been very different, but it seems like the expectations for research output um, and more of that scholarly research output is really ramping up everywhere. Um, I taught in Utah at a primarily teaching focused school and even there because of the job market, they were able to get all of these amazing researchers and they had to, to create all this output. So I really do, yeah, I agree that things have really changed quite a bit over the last 20 years. So design research to me, means that research that positively impacts society. Then at Iowa State, it, um, how does that reflect the mission of the university, which is, Iowa State is a land grant institution. So again, so my idea of what research mirrors what the university does, you know, to, to help people. And uh, then uh, in terms of research, how does it build on and expand and push the collective body of knowledge further. Um, and then the other thing to think about, you know, talking what, expanding what other people said, there's a difference between public and private education and the focus on research at one and the focus on research on, on the other. You know, both are different, um, you know, some, uh, private have tenure, some others do not. And it depends on, you know, who we're talking to and the people that, you know, who, who hopefully are going to listen to this to make sure that we don't exclude those that are not part of, um, of, of, of state education. Um, Iowa State in the College of Design um, understands research through making through writing and through exhibiting. So it's a broad platform for people to uh, obtain uh, tenure if they are tenure track. Great. So I'm going to um, sort of put my design incubation hat on here for a sec. So I'll, I'll just kind of note when I'm talking about when the eyes ideas I'm talking about sort of come from more from that organization and then more when they come from me as an individual contributor and a faculty person as Eris Sharon, because I think it's important to be really clear about that distinction. Um, so what I'm gonna do um, at the, you know, not to bore anybody, but I, I wanna sort of frame this a little bit in the way that we've been thinking about this over the last five or six years, and also suggest that perhaps the question should be, um, widened. So when I think about this question, I think people are constantly asking, what does research mean? And what they may actually mean is what does scholarship mean? And those things are really different. And so I would say the, the question that might be helpful, for, especially for newer faculty, is to think about this idea of scholarship and pedagogy and how they're actually different, though there's um, than research and maybe documentation of teaching. And so what I'm gonna just do is I'm gonna read sort of the definition of research that we have created. And um, maybe there's even an opportunity for a slide so somebody watching this doesn't have to listen to <laughs> this too closely. But um, research refers to the systemic investigation into the study of materials and sources with the goal of establishing facts and working to reach new conclusions. And so that's sort of the definition that we've used. And then scholarship occurs when that research reaches a suitably high level. So if we just sort of walk that back to my own experience as an individual contributor, I might be doing research on some specific area around history of design. Maybe some of my first work was in um, women in design. But you know, not everything I do is necessarily that great. And so for it to be counted or recognized, that research has to sort of reach a level in terms of understanding the context and 
um, other people's work and drawings, you know, and, and maybe then building on that work with some new ideas or new conclusions for it to reach the level of scholarship, which is really what people in administration and university tenure committees are looking for. They're not necessarily saying, you know, did you do some research in your room um, at midnight when you couldn't sleep? They're saying like, does this reach this suitably high level? And I just want to note that when I get um, tenure documents to review um, from other institutions, sometimes there is this wording around um, new ideas, but it, it is really with this idea, rarely do we have a completely new idea. We're building on the work of, of you know, previous researchers and previous scholars, whether it's creative work where we're always looking for, um, looking at what people have done before for inspiration or whether it's uh, publishing, whatever that may be. And then I'm, you know, I don't, I don't want to take too long on this, but I did want to say that there's this real difference between pedagogy and what is often, um, what is often done in design. And I think that that is often a point of friction for people in their own institutions because pedagogy is sort of this method of practice of teaching um, an academic subject or concept. And it's concerned with the theory and science of teaching, meaning we're again going back and saying, we're not just saying like, what did I do last year in my type one class, which is maybe really interesting and have validity, but we're looking at that in relationship to what other people have done and sort of what that means about the science and the theories around teaching going forward. And so I think that that's something that I see newer faculty get tripped up on is that they do something that I would call documentation of teaching and they call it pedagogy. And then um, that used to be kind of acceptable, but now as I, like what I've seen from newer faculty is they get up the ladder in terms of those committees and people are like, wait, 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 that's not actually pedagogy as it's sort of universally understood. And so those are just some ideas that I think might be helpful for newer faculty to be thinking of as they navigate where to spend their time. Because I think that's most important is we have so many ideas and so many interests, but the question is really where do we spend our time in, in terms of getting up that tenure track ladder? So I just want to add, thank you for that, for, for speaking to that, Eris, because I think we've all, well, I shouldn't say we all, but I, I've certainly ha am, am in some of that right now, distinguishing between, I had a, a senior faculty person take a look at, you know, some of my documentation and, and really needing to clarify, well, what part of this is, is like, just like the teaching part and what part of this is the scholarship part that there needs to be clear distinction between those two if, if I'm, you know, looking at it objectively. And I think that points to, yeah, a lot of things that become confusing, especially because design is still a fairly new discipline in academia in terms of, you know, refining it and talking about it in that way. And so there's these ideas of research, as Allison pointed out, that also happens in industry. So what, what is design research? Is it valid to be doing that kind of research? And then when is it elevated to scholarship? Um, and then that piece of so many designers for a, a long time have kind of used um, their teaching and their, you know, their practices of pedagogy as that scholarship because we didn't know what else to do. And it's important, right, talking about how we educate designers. But yeah, I think that just points to all of this friction that, that as a discipline we've been experiencing for um, several decades now. What ways do you see research has changed? Um, what do you think you would want to tell people on the tenure track or not who are at these institutions? Things for them to kind of keep in mind. Um, it's terrifying out there and not just because of the teaching. How do we keep creating scholarship? How do we keep creating research? All the rules seem to sort of be changing all the time. So I didn't know if the four of you um, had any thoughts or advice um, for the participants in our audience as they're kind of like dealing with that. You know, I always, I always think about uh, teaching, the way I'm teaching and the way I'm researching um, in terms of the way I was taught. 
-hmm. in the past. So sort of like, so if I'm teaching the way I was taught and researching the way that I researched, I'm not preparing students or myself for the future. You know, and design has fundamentally changed and will continue to rapidly evolve and change. And I suppose we are all in the business of folding time, teaching students now for the possibilities of what that future will be. And that's become increasingly more challenging, you know, with COVID-19. You know, I think in some ways research has changed and in many ways it is not. COVID-19 offers us the possibility consider, to consider new teaching mechanisms, new courses, new majors, new ways to conduct research and create new research ideas. But we have to be nimble, think on our feet and adapt. Innovation and change is happening and will continue to happen at light speed, but the institutions work at snail speed. And that gap has gotten dangerously wide. I mean, we, we run the risk of becoming irrelevant, you know, and, you know, we see that every day as most, as, as, as sadly that many institutions are closing their doors, you know. And I suppose research can become the driving mechanism to allow the institutions to achieve, this is my science fiction head, warp speed. We need to consider that some research areas may be difficult to adapt in the COVID-19 world. I think in some ways it may open up opportunities and access. So conferences such as this, uh, when I was a junior faculty member and didn't have money to travel, anywhere or the entrance fee for the conference or, or any of that. So I, I'm really excited about these kinds of opportunities. Um, so I just wanted to put out that it's not all, you know, scary. This is a relatively simple and affordable thing for the DEC to do, for AIGA to do. So they're saving money in many ways and we're saving money. Um, I wouldn't want to lose those in, in person opportunities, but maybe there's a, a, a hybrid of the two that we can do going forward to keep that access uh, going. Um, and maybe in those venues, we encourage more MFA students uh, and PhD students to present their work. Um, so they're practicing, they're getting feedback, uh, they're setting up their agenda so that they can speak about it when they when they move forward. So um, back in May, I uh, did a, pan a virtual panel discussion for DEC on the value of design education. And one of the questions that um, we talked about is um, in terms of like research and teaching is uh, like things that are community based. So social impact design, community based work and how the, the nature of that changes. Uh, my friend and collaborator, Penny Achayo, that's, that's her bread and butter. And so she has really had to learn on the fly, like how, how do I transition, um, like the things that my student, the projects my students are doing, because they're still really important because they've got community partners, right? They've got these community connections that are, that they're trying to build over the long term, right? Not just sort of a drop in, do this project and then leave. Um, so it's it's like long-term investment. So how does the nature of that change? But she also for her own research um, You know, she's originally from Uganda. She can't travel there at the moment. So, and, you know, she's tenure track So how does that change? So um, all this is to say that that There is a lot of conversation happening around even that, you know, again, whether we're talking about teaching or or research and what the limitations are. But yeah, I think that um, that there is, in some ways, it's opening up access to people who might not have been able to before. I think there are more avenues for at least having conversations and sharing um, the kind of things 
the kinds of things that people are working on. Um, in terms of like what is considered maybe peer reviewed or like when we're talking that specifically, I will be curious to see how that shifts as well. Um, Cause again, these are questions I'm thinking about. I it's really exciting and sort of terrifying at the same time to be in what everybody's calling an unprecedented moment, sort of not the time you want to be doing something that already feels like you're on unfirm ground. But one thing I would say is that um, something Bern sort of pointed to in the chat is, you know, is there an opportunity for greater inclusivity if we're in a virtual space with high school teachers, with MFA students, sort of like others have said, I mean, that's kind of exciting um, to think about that. When, so I would say that I'm, you know, maybe as a, because of my age or when I got into education, but when this sort of all first started, first of all, we didn't anticipate it necessarily lasting this long in March, but, um, what I had a lot of discussions, so I run uh, Design Incubation Fellowship, which is a three-day workshop on writing, and I was like, we're postponing, right? I was like, ah, oh. and my colleague and co-chair, Dan Wong, was like, um, no, that's not really very feasible for a lot of reasons. You know, you need to move and rethink this, and he was exactly right, you know? And so we moved online, and it took a t tremendous amount of work, um, to sort of rethink what this would be like in another format. And then I did another event like that. And I would say that what did has sort of um, bubbled up from that was people who said that it was gonna be a tremendous hardship for them to use their own funds to say, come to New York for three days, which is very legitimate, where all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, there's a little wiggle room now because my institution was only gonna pay like $400 of this and I had to you know, come up with the other funds. So you know, does, does this create opportunity? I would also like to circle back to something that's sort of maybe, maybe a little bit of the elephant in the room. And I just say this because I spent, in, you know, in June I, and late May, I spent, had the you know, pleasure of spending so much time with about, I think, 20 different faculty, mostly junior, and they were talking about the sort of COVID moment and what that means for their research. And I do think it's really important to say that this is probably not the moment for all faculty to pivot to doing COVID related research. <laughs> because when, you know, we don't know how long this is gonna last, but when you go to tenure, go up for tenure and go through those communities, they are gonna be looking for this sort of through line. And the fact that you have not just done research, but you, you know, elevated that to scholarship and that it has sort of, um, that there's a, that it relates to each other, that you become an expert, right? So that's something that gets asked once you're through tenure for promotion is like, are you now sort of an, do you have this expertise that's widely recognized? And by pivoting, you can really, you know, to saying like, oh, you know, this moment is it's like the time sort of thing, like don't, you know, why you don't need to write a COVID novel right now. <laughs> um, and I think that that's really true is that unless it relates pretty directly to the other work that you have been doing, um, or you have the freedom after tenure to sort of pivot, um, that this might not be the moment for you to focus, to refocus all of your energy on some very specific new thing. And I think this, this moves off in a slightly different direction, but I think here is where mentorship becomes really important. Um, I should also mention, so this is my first tenure track position, but I, I, was, I taught several years before um, so I had, I guess you could think of it as some, some time to sort of observe, <laughs> observe the tenure process, the academic process, um, before really getting into it myself. Um, but there's still more questions, right, even as you're in the midst of the process. And I think I'm fortunate that I'm at an institution where I do absolutely have mentorship and support, and it's clear that um, my colleagues want me to be successful. Um, but what do you do if you're not? Or what do you do if you are the lone design person um, and you are having, yes, exactly, having to define design, you know, for yourself, for your department, for your, you know, college, for your university um, is really challenging. And so I think, I mean, I would be interested to hear others' thoughts about like the mentorship piece, um, but I will also just add in here, like uh, being a black woman in academia is also incredibly challenging in these ways. And so there's, there's sort of those added pressures and, and not, 
many of us in design specifically. Um, but I'm curious to hear others talk about like the mentorship piece, whether on the receiving end or, or providing mentorship for others. It's because we need to remember the participants who are in the shift summit are kind of coming from all over the place. Um, some of many of them are, of course, in the US and within our academic system, but that is stratified uh, in, a, in a million different ways. We have um, people who are high school teachers. We have people who are teaching at community colleges. Um, and then we have people who are all over the globe who've kind of signed in. So kind of thinking about this idea of mentorship. Um, and then also maybe after we talk about that, we could also talk about what does research or just creative practice look like um, for people who aren't necessarily in the, the tenure track system. And you all might have thoughts about that or not, because <laughs> we're all sort of baked into um, our, the institutions that we're part of. But so let's talk about mentorship and then maybe we can come back and pick up the thread of um, just maybe some thoughts or ideas for those people who are not within that traditional tenure track. I'll take a stab at it first. I think that, you know, everybody has value. Mm. Everybody. And whatever people are doing in terms of research to them, that has value too. There's no right research or no wrong research. And I think that's where we need to, to start from. And I think, you know, a mentor is someone who obviously helps, advocates, and speaks truth. Who's willing to build a personal relationship with individuals where that individual feels that they can trust and ask the hard questions in confidence. And I've seen those relationships last a lifetime. You know, and I've seen those relationships that end very quickly because the mentor broke that trust, which is unconscionable. Well, I guess I, I already mentioned this, but I, again, you know, I'm interested in, in hearing what others have to say about this. I think I, I was at a point where, as I mentioned, I, I was in a not full-time non-tenure track position before this one. And, you know, it was a good job, but it, I found myself spending a lot of time mentoring, supporting, assisting others, mostly students, which I, I was happy to, you know, it just comes naturally, right? Which I was happy to do. Um, but, but then it, it's what I, I often refer to, like when you're on a plane and the, you know, the, the, they say if the, the cabin pressure drops and the masks come down, you need to put yours on first before you help the person next to you. And I try to always have that visual in mind because I've, I found myself in a position where I was just getting burned out. I wasn't giving anything to myself really. And so I was running out of, I was running out of juice very quick and becoming bitter in the, a little bit bitter in the process. So my own experience is like, it's, it is very fulfilling to help other people. Um, and I hope that I'm always able to do that. But, but then it becomes this other, the other piece of it is like having to nurture your, yourself as well. Um, so it is sort of this continuum. Yeah, everybody needs mentors at every step of the way. And so, um, you know, just because you're tenured doesn't mean that that process stops, that you, you know, you still need the people who help kind of support you and push you. So I, um, I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I have that now at my current institution. Um, but I'm, again, curious to hear kind of what that trajectory has been like for others. But I think you often need multiple mentors as well. And so uh, I always encourage people to, even though we have a mentorship program and at different times assign mentors, uh, that you find a faculty member that you have a connection to, that can be your connection to teaching and culture uh, and all of the day-to-day -day kinds of things, but that when it comes to your scholarship, 
that you look for most likely, sometimes these come together, but most likely you're looking for another mentor who can do um, kind of what Byrne was saying and push you and be honest about those aspects of your scholarship while you have this other person who can push you and question you about teaching and uh, fill you in on the culture of the institution. Um, and I think both are so important in that tenure process. Uh, I had a very senior faculty member um, who was somebody I just had an affinity for, and he was an amazing teacher until the day he walked out the doors of the institution. Um, and he was always saying to me, you know, take a look at what you need to be doing. Don't burn yourself out in this process. You know, you're doing a great job at these things. You know, um, did you think about this? Uh, but then I had to go to somebody else in terms of what I needed to be doing for my scholarship. So um, I feel lucky to have heard everybody's sort of take on this before and be able to build on that. And I just want to say that what Bernard said about everybody having value and all of that research having value is, I think, really important. What I do think we need to just sort of build on what he sort of started with saying about mentorship and be in the honesty is that while all of that has value, how your institution, your particular institution sees it may be very different. And so hopefully what a mentor will do is help say, okay, like this is this thing you're really passionate about and it has a ton of value. <laughs> and you also maybe now need to do X, Y, and Z or posit it in this other way or do this offshoot of the project so that you're able to continue doing this kind of work at this institution by moving through the tenure clock, right? And so I think that that's one of the things that mentorship can do. The other thing I just think is really important because I'm assuming um, because of the nature of this topic that a good number of people will be untenured possibly in positions where there isn't tenure. And that is that it's really important to stay active after tenure or after hitting whatever mark your institution has for seniority. Because what I see a lot is people kind of reinventing the wheel. And some of that is because faculty don't stay act as active and engaged after they've hit whatever kind of new seniority mark allows them to take a breath, which is very understandable, like take a breath for a year and then come back, please, and re-engage. Um, so if you see me looking down, it's often me just kind of making a few notes to make sure that I don't forget everything. But one of the things um, that I think that we were going to get to maybe later in this conversation and I'm going to bring to the forefront here is around mentorship is um, this idea of like what, uh, what, our what our professional organizations can do. And this is something Design Incubation has been thinking about. Um, but I also just as an individual have mentored faculty both from my own institution and faculty from other institutions. And I think there's really a lot of value to having a mentor who is actually not at your institution, especially if you're in a position like Anne was, who was looking to move from an untenured role, uh, track role to a tenure track position, or maybe moving, looking to move from um, a uh, more teaching institution to a research one. If, you, if you're trying to move around or change what you do, I think it'd be very, very helpful to have mentors outside of your institution, in addition to maybe the person like Allison said, who was paired with you in your own institution. Um, and I would really push, you know, we've been thinking about that a lot at Design Incubation and just haven't had the bandwidth, like how to figure out how to do that. And if there's an opportunity to take something back to AIGA and maybe AIGA DC, I would say there, it would be an amazing thing if there could be some kind of structure set up to pair people and to maybe even give preference to people who are the only designer um, like you are at your own, like when you're a single contributor at your institution in design, like that person needs a mentor outside of their, outside of their institution. And it would be great if the professional organizations could help with that. So, so I'm going to add, thank you for that, Eris, and it's, it's true, and I feel like the more, again, the longer I've been in academia, the more I, I've, there have been larger, I've grown my own network, right, and that has included more people, and so some, sometimes, I mean, that has happened naturally um, in some ways, but I love the idea of, of 
especially for people who are new to academia, trying to, you know, trying to find a foothold or build or grow those communities for themselves, having some support for that. Um, so, so I'm going to ask then, so what happens if you're at an institution where maybe you're not having a super positive experience or you haven't found that person or people to help support? Um, again, I'm, I'm curious, throwing the, the question out there, curious to know, um, you know, my younger self would have asked this question. So, so then what do you do? You find yourself in this position at an institution and you're not finding the support, then what? Well, I'll, I'll jump in first. Sorry, Allison. Um, what I did, having jumped around to a few places, is try to get to know people in other departments. Um, so, of course, depending on the size of the institution, you may or may not have viable candidates <laughs> for mentorship within your own department or even your own section of the university or the college. Um, so I just tried to meet people and network as much as possible to then identify potential mentors outside. And a lot of times it's a really great idea to have at least one of those people outside your department so you can go to them when you're having friction inside your department. Um, but that's one thing that I have tried to do. And then Allison, it sounds like maybe you had some thoughts too. Well, I was just gonna mention my experience with the design education community. So Eris brought it up. Um, and I would say that I was kind of in that phase where I was looking at my department and saying, there aren't that many people that are highly engaged right now. And I needed to go outside to get that engagement. Um, and so uh, I would really encourage people to go to the conferences, talk to people, meet as many people from different institutions as possible, get energized by that, uh, and maybe find that mentor through uh, those opportunities. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see what we can do in this virtual environment. Um, are we going to be able to have through those conferences, not just through chat features, but you know, one-on-one -on -one connections, small groups, uh, which are the things that made those conferences so valuable to me. Um, and I would also say that, you know, um, the design education community, I was fortunate to be there when uh, dialectic and dialogue were being created. What you need to know that behind the scenes, there is such a heavy lift uh, to make those things happen. A shout out to Michael Gibson uh, and his tenacity for, for staying with that and keeping that going. And one of the things that's difficult about organizations like the DEC are that um, your terms end. Um, and then initiatives, it's hard to keep them, them going from one group to the next and interests change and things like that. And um, I think they're doing a great job of doing that right now, of keeping, keeping things going despite the changing people on the board and just letting those perspectives come in. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a great idea to, to find a way for the DEC or other, other organizations to have a mentorship opportunity. But I also know what the bandwidth is uh, for doing that. I think I want to come back to, you know, the, again, you know, what Anna's talking about, and it's sort of not that you were talking about that as well, but it's this thing about honesty and transparency that happens on the interview process. You know, when somebody is coming for a tenure track position, I think it's incumbent on the committee and the chair and the deans, you know, to, to be as honest as possible of what family that you're coming into, you know, dysfunctional, you know, and, 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 and then the candidate can make the right decision to either come or not. And I think, sometimes there's a lack of honesty on the interview process of that. And when somebody comes in thinking it's going to be one suit that they're going to be wearing and then holy cow, it's a different kind of suit that you're wearing, you know, and, and, and that's when it can fall apart. And I think that's where the, you know, the, the, 
mentor relationship, you know, can be honest and sort of say, you know, this is the way you navigate this and are you willing to navigate this? But it's not an easy process. I mean, you know, I'm the poster child of this. I mean, you know, I started my teaching career at SCAD um, a million years ago when dinosaurs ruled the earth. And, um, and I have an eight year stint. I mean, I went from there to MICA, from MICA to MCAD, from MCAD to Ringling and Ringling to here. And I've been eight years at Iowa State University and um, maybe I'm a coward uh, or, or not, but I think it's sort of like, it's not a good feeling to be at a place where, you know, you feel that people, and I'm not saying that that's why I moved, I'll be clear, but it's sort of like, I've seen people, faculty become really disillusioned because they're, you know, they're in a family where it's every day, it's like you feel a bit of your soul getting eaten away. And that's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. It should be the most inspirational job that you've ever had. And that's a tough decision. If it's not that, I mean, the question is, do you want to spend the rest of your life? You know? Uh, gosh, there's not enough. There's not enough alcohol in the world to fill that void. And I also wanted to mention that I think mentorship at the uh, MFA within MFA programs. Uh, I think PhD and doctoral programs do a better job of preparing faculty because the tradition is there for that. But as long as an MFA is still considered a terminal degree for many institutions, that those programs have to do a better job of mentoring their, their students who are interested in becoming faculty. Uh, I've sat in interviews where uh, a designer has no idea what scholarship means. Um, and that's embarrassing for them, and it's embarrassing for me. Uh, and you know, if they had been prepared by their MFA programs, they wouldn't be in that position. Uh, if they'd been given the opportunity to practice what it is to present their research uh, in an academic setting instead of in an industry setting. And I, I just think that's a really important component of the mentorship process. Can I? Can I just step in for a second here? Allison, I think you told me, you probably won't remember this, but it made a big impression on me. You told me a number of years ago that one of the things that happens in interviews that you've been in when you're not um, at the department level is that uh, prospective faculty members, applicants are being asked what their research trajectory is, what their research agenda is, and that you have been kind of appalled at the fact that not all of the candidates can answer that, but really feel like they weren't prepared to answer that question. So I wonder if you could just speak to that for a sec. Yeah, I just, it's entirely, well, it's not entirely not their fault, right? Um, because one of the things that they need to do is, is do their research on the institution, again, that they're going to ask questions, ask questions of the department chair in terms of what they would like them to prepare uh, and then ask colleagues who are faculty members uh, what that means. Um, because it, it just, it's such a painful experience to watch somebody uh, sit there. And when you know you've seen their teaching demonstration and the demonstration that they've done of their work at the department level, and it's fabulous. Uh, and they're exactly the kind of faculty member you want. They just didn't have the language to speak about it in an interview. Um, so that's on all of us to try to get that information out to people who are interviewing um, and to help them prepare for those things. And this actually comes to a point further down in our list of questions. I don't know that we're gonna to get to all of them, which is totally fine. Um, but this idea of um, inclusivity and accessibility um, especially of academia, um, but design education in general, you know, who gets to come to that table? 
uh, how do we empower and support different kinds of researchers, educators, to be able to come to that table. And I think the MFA um, programs really need to do a better job, a lot of them, of helping to do that work, which is easy for me to say. I'm not teaching in one of them right now. I don't have to do any of that mentorship. But um, having had really strong mentorship in that area and the program that I went through, um, I think that it really is um, crucial. Uh, and then just academia is so, dense and sort of obtuse, right? Like how do we, how do we help um, people who got into design because they were maybe interested in specific aspects of that? How do we help them kind of uh, bridge all of those crazy things that we're asking them to do when they get into academia? So that was very rambly, but I don't know if any of you have any thoughts about that. So it's very important well, to me. Yeah, no, I, I feel everything you're saying, Lisa. Um, there's a book that a friend recommended to me a few years ago, The Black Academic's Guide to Winning Tenure Without Losing Your Soul, which I think every academic should have to, have to read, regardless of where they're at in an institution, um, because it, it speaks to um, some of the, the emotions that you feel and, and sort of the psychological piece, but then also lays out some strategies for here are ways to think about these kind of scenarios and it goes it even touches on um, to, to use your phrasing burn uh, this family aspect that you're walking into and prepping you for how to think about when you're you're vis visiting a campus I guess we're, we're not doing on campus visits at the, at, the, at the moment but to think about the culture of the, the place that you're in so it's not just like do I want this job but how does the system around me operate am I the kind of person that will operate well in this system in this culture um, so that, that book has been a, a huge help. Um, but I also think that I, I come from a family of academics. So in some ways I was already like, I, you know, I grew up hanging out on a college campus cause that's where mom and dad worked. Um, I, that doesn't mean that this is what I envisioned doing when I was, was little, um, or that, you know, I, even in grad school, I, I, I didn't know that I wanted to teach really. I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. Um, but that, I mean, that's where the mentorship piece becomes really important, right? And people pushing you uh, as, as, as others have mentioned. Um, but there is, there is an extent to which, you know, there, there are times even now I feel like I'm swimming among sharks, right? Or I'm barely keeping my head above water or, and again, you know, I'm saying this also from the perspective of being a black woman even though there are many ways in which I was prepared for what I'm doing now, there are many ways in which I, it has still been a really huge, there have just been barriers, right? There have been barriers. And I think about the, the fact that we don't have a lot of black faculty in design in academia, certainly not in tenure track or tenured positions. And so looking, so, so Part of the question for me and the bundle of questions that you're asking is, I'm thinking about from that very specific perspective, what is preventing the, the black students that we happen to have in design? What, what is stopping them from pursuing advanced degrees? And if they make it through a grad program, congratulations, but then like the net, another step, like now I'm, now I'm gonna go teach and do all these other things and be held to this other, these other standards, um, there's just a lot. <laughs> There's, I mean, a lot for anybody, but certainly um, for some people, there are going to be more barriers than others. And so I think that this is a question I've been thinking about. I don't, again, I don't, it's not like I have answers to give, but I think these questions are really important because if we want to diversify, and not just in terms of, of ethnicity and race, but in terms of voices, then how do we make it the tenure process or even just getting into academia or even getting into a grad program feel like yeah i can i can do it it's do, it's going to take a lot of work it's going to be hard but i can do it so um i just like to jump in and say that um i think this is something that i struggle with a lot because i um, i'm a white woman teaching in an institution where i think about 40 percent of the students identify as students of color. Um, and so, and I think that this is not um, atypical in terms of who was hired 
15 and 20 years ago, right, when I was looking for jobs, right, that's, the, if there are barriers now, the barriers then were even more difficult to, um, to think about, um, you know, moving through. And so when I see students who are some of my best students, I feel like the, the system around an MFA, you know, just what it takes to go through an MFA program, particularly here in New York, where the best programs are all at the art schools and are very expensive. So it's a very disincentivizing process. You have to take two, two to three years off and not just take two to three years off, like not be employed and go into debt. And so if you, I think there's a really important distinction you made, um, and about kind of having grown up in academia and then still finding a lot of challenges. But for my students, it's, you often have poverty overlaid the issues around um, you know, race and color. And so it's not just one, it's like kind of this double whammy. And then, so if, if that wasn't bad enough, and, and like Anne said, if you make it into that MFA program, the fact that the whole tenure process and how little, um, how little agreement there is about what that looks like between institutions, how obtuse that is, how much it feels like a black box, means that faculty who are disadvantaged, whether they be faculty of color, whether they um, identify as different, maybe because of disability, whatever it is, they are additionally disincentivized from staying in the system because it's really natural when you faced adversity your whole life to think like, is this because I'm whatever, right? When often you'll find huge struggle for sort of understanding this system that isn't well quantified and isn't sort of out there and transparent, even for people who come from privilege, right? And so you have this sort of disincentivization all along the way. Um, and I don't really have a solution, but I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that, you know, there's, there's a variety of levels at which people opt out, like sort of take themselves out. And it's very difficult when there are all these sort of barriers, even for people of, of privilege, like how do you get people who don't come from that privilege to want to be part of this system? And I'll just point out, um, Byrne had included some really great thoughts in the chat about the fact that a lot of things are changing um, in terms of the MFA terminal degree versus a PhD, especially in other countries. Um, and that higher ed is not doing a great job with encouraging and accepting minorities as we've all been kind of talking about. Um, and then, you know, the fact that the cost of education is a huge barrier and problem for lots of things and lots of, lots of people, lots of reasons. So those are great points too. I do just want to say that, you know, there's no solution here. It's a huge problem, but this idea of mentorship, we sort of keep coming back to it and it, in some ways, it sort of feels like a Band-Aid, but I can say having, um, you know, maybe having a more public face now than, than I did when I was doing my own research, right, through, through another organization and an organization that doesn't have term limits. So I keep being the public face of uh, part, one of the public faces of the institution means that I do get unsolicited calls or sort of referrals a lot. And um, have, so I've engaged with sort of less formal mentoring or with people who are not at my own institution who are struggling with a lot of these issues. And I would say that as we think about mentorship, of course, there's opportunities for this really like one-on-one -on -one long term mentorship. And I, you know, I do work with a couple of people that way, but mostly, you know, even just being able to pick up the phone and ask questions. I have a job interview. What questions should I be asking? What should I be looking for? An hour on Zoom, you know can make a huge difference for someone to understand that strange things that they think are happening are maybe not because they feel like they came to the table disadvantaged, that it's this strange sort of thing we're all going through. So it can help with some of that level setting just around expectations, or it can say, no, like you might wanna take a step back. This, this seems like you're being asked to do something that doesn't feel right as we look at a broad range of how institutions um, think about what your duty should be. And that's, I think, some of that can be done in much more informal, much shorter kinds of experiences, but it's kind of a hard conversation to have. So like going up to someone with a beer at a conference and being like, hey, I'm having this struggle, you wanna help me with it, feels a little strange, right? So that's where I think quantifying some of that and creating some structures, even if it's a list of people who are willing to answer their email could be really helpful. 
But I, I think it's also helpful to think of it as a continuum too, or like leveled sort of mentorship, uh, if that language is useful. But that, yeah, not every sort of mentorship relationship, I shouldn't put in quotation marks, but every sort of mentor relationship is going to be like a long-term investment. I mean, sometimes, you know, people mentor you when you are at certain points along your trajectory and, you know, the varying levels at which you need support. I think, you know, in some ways, maybe it's, I think Allison spoke to this earlier too, like you, you know, support for teaching or maybe it's emotional support versus like support for scholarship and helping you wade through those, those kind of experiences. But, but I also think that um, as an educator too, I think about it in some of the things we're talking about in terms of like how I interact with my students as well. Um, and you never really know what, I feel like four years is not often enough time to really see a potential of a student. And I think there are some ways in which maybe even as, a, as an educator, just trying to be conscientious in how I engage my students. Because sometimes it's easy to write students off if they aren't getting their work done or whatever. Um, but to, to really try and provide support um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I want I want to be more diligent and not just sort of writing students off if they're not getting their homework done on time kind of a thing. And then I'm really trying to engage and be supportive because I don't know how important that may be three months, six months, a year down the road. Um, but I will also say that I even as undergrads, I tell students, I, I try to put the idea in their minds that, you know, you might want to teach one day, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, but, you know, I'm going to think about teaching, you're really good at XYZ. So it's something to think about. Um, but, but yeah, I think the engagement on an individual level, even if it doesn't seem like it's making a huge speaking of impact, a huge impact in that moment, maybe it's making impact beyond what we can sort of see or, or perceive. One of the things that I found challenging when I was on the DEC in dealing with AIGA was that AIGA only wanted to put superstars anywhere and on everything. Um, and we all have a little bit of that instinct, right? So when we go to a conference, uh, does someone want to hear from me? Or do they want to hear from Michael Beirut, you know, uh, or whomever? Um, however, the depth of faculty is incredible and untapped, right? Um, without being chair of the DEC, no one ever would have met me, right? Um, but I'm willing to help and mentor. I answer my emails instantaneously. Um, you know, I. I'm willing to do that. And I'm sure there are many other faculty that are willing to do that. Whereas when we put the superstars out there who also teach a class, do they really understand what is going on at academic institutions? Maybe some of them do, but I'm guessing the majority of them haven't had to go through that path. Um, so I guess that's just uh, to advocate for the depth of faculty that are out there and willing to help. Um, and if you are junior faculty, seek those people out because they have more time. Uh, they understand the process that you're going through in a different way. Well, and I also think that there's the opportunity because of the, the nature of the, you know, networked world that we live in now that you don't necessarily have to do all of these things face to face. Um, I got through being on the job market by trolling the Chronicles forums uh, it, where lots of people asked all these questions that were very context specific and about hiring and all sorts of things. And I learned so much just by reading other people's questions. Um, and then being able to email people in that less formal way as Eris was kind of talking about. So I think that there's untapped potential with that too. The fact that we can so much more easily connect with somebody in, in, in that way versus the beer at the conference, right? Where you may or may not want to dish about that, that thing. You can kind of revisit it and go back to it. So um, I think that uh, that's something that, that, that is there too. You know, it, impact sometimes can be the elephant in the room. 
if it's not you know, if it's not described clearly in the promotion and tenure language at the institution i mean you know the thing that you know i struggle with is that you know, if that information is not clear you know in terms of like conferences how are they ranked publications how are they ranked does one conference um count for more in a tenure package than, than not um does one published paper you know count for more than another um you know uh, how much does does um how much does local national and international you know and then within those variables of sort of certain conferences uh within that because i mean you know there's a industry that's been created uh to feed tenure i mean you know and we'll get to talk hopefully about that later but in terms of impact you know how is that metric evaluated you know you know were there 30,000 applicants for a conference and only 200 were accepted you know when i see some faculty you know on 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 um tenure uh, dossiers that i've um evaluated where that was not clear you know that was not clear and i don't think it's the faculty in question's fault it's because you know the language was not in clear in their pnt documents at the institution well i think that also points to just how fraught it is as and can probably speak to this as well being still on the tenure track trying to navigate all of this and figure it all out especially those of us who've been at more than one institution um there's so many as allison mentioned unwritten rules <laughs> Well, I also wanted to say in terms of impact and also explaining to people outside of your discipline what the impact is, is, is a big hurdle, right? Um, and so at an institution like mine, so I'm not at an art school, your tenure file is reviewed first by your department. So you have to get through a department that understands what impact they want. And then you've got to get through the campus committee, which most likely has nobody from your department on it uh, and explain that impact there uh, and to do it succinctly in your documents so uh, bernard did a good job of saying there were thirty thousand um, people who applied and 200 who were published that's what that committee wants to know um, if you launch into this giant description of why this is an important journal within the design fields or why how our print is important, uh, they don't want to read that. Uh, make it as simple for them to understand within the language that they understand. Impact is something that comes up um, a lot and we sort of see it as like maybe this is a way to get some of that different kinds of projects and materials included and counted. And I'm a huge advocate for it, but I like to give the example of my good friend, James Panafino, um, who did this book a number of years ago, and I'm gonna just read the title, Interdisciplinary Interaction Design. It's $12.99 on, on Amazon, and people who teach interaction design usually know it. So, this is some, some sort of information about impact just kind of under the hood that you don't normally see. So I, so James tried to get this book um, sort of picked up by mainstream publishers. And frankly, it's too short and they won't make, an, they wouldn't make enough money on it. And I hope, James, you don't mind me saying that. But um, it's just the business model wasn't there. And so because we have to sort of work within the business model that exists, and it's, it's you know, largely a model around profit, so I have published a number of books and this little book has, I think, outsold all each one of my books with maybe the exception where we're like neck and neck on one, right? So if you think about impact, 
um, James's book should be like right up there or definitely above all the stuff that I've done, right? <laughs> and yet, because I went through mainstream publishers and because they were peer reviewed and many of the publishers were international or very well known, um, the reality is that he had more of a struggle getting that book to be recognized, even with the Amazon sales data, right? Um, and I would say that they, you know, how many design students, how many practicing, I mean, he crossed over between designers and design students. I mean, it was, it's like everything you want of a project and yet his institution had a really hard time with that. And my institution was like, oh, you have an international publisher. It was peer reviewed, you know, stamp, right? And so some of the work has to be done by institutions also to help hopefully broaden the idea of where impact matters. And that whole idea about how many people see things, I also wanna just circle back to Bernard's point, like the 30,000 applicants versus the 200 published, like, and then how many people maybe see James's book versus mine. This is something that I, I think is interesting to know is really important in our discipline. T tends to be that designers want their stuff to be seen by a lot of people, right? That that's like an important thing for us. But I think it's really important to take for granted that that's not the case in all disciplines. So friends of mine who work in very specific areas in you know, 18th century English literature, they're trying, they're doing a very different thing and they're talking about some things that are way more granular and specific than many of us are interested in. And the idea is that if a few people working in that area then build on that work, that is tremendous impact. And that is actually more important, they sort of poo-poo public scholars who want the work to be seen more broadly. And so I do think that as we talk about what Allison said, where we start in the department, we go to the college, we end up at a university committee in most institutions in terms of tenure and promotion, it's, it's useful to understand that some of the things that we take for granted are not necessarily how other people in other disciplines are gonna value scholarship. And I just want to jump in there and say that I advocate all the time for people getting involved outside of their departments. So if you're sitting in your department complaining or not knowing, get out, right? Get out and learn what other people on your campus are thinking and doing and participating in. Um, I've met very few people uh, from the design or arts background who have moved beyond being a dean into upper administration. Um, and I would argue that if you're not at the table, you can't make the changes, right? So um, it's always called going to the dark side, I understand, and, and I've come back to faculty and I understand that feeling entirely. Um, but it did allow me to have impact in a far greater way than if I had only ever stayed within my own department. So I could influence the Dean of the School of Business when I was an Associate Dean of the School of Business in terms of his understanding of what scholarship was within design. Um, I could get involved in creating the tenure and promotion documents for the college. Um, and beyond and make sure that the language was there that needed to be there even if they were tiny shifts, um, and they were often tiny shifts, um, I was still there able to make some of those. So um, I think you can take ownership at every level. I think what Eris is saying in terms of reviewing other institutions, so she's, she's making that shift that way, which is also good, right? Wherever you can try to, try to make the shift and make it clearer for everybody. So Allison, I'm going to follow up. How did you how did you end up moving into upper administration? Were there people who encouraged, suggested? Did you when you were sort of in those upper echelons administratively? Did you have support? Like how did you move? Because I think from my vantage point, it's like, oh no way, I don't want to. But you know what you're saying is really important, and I'm I'm already thinking to myself, wow, that's that's true what she's saying. 
Um, so how did you, I guess, what was needed for you to feel like you could do the things you were doing? So uh, every position that I had, I didn't want to start with. So I understand that, that instinct. I said, no way to wanting to be department chair. And the dean of the School of Business at the time talked me into doing it. Um, and then that same dean talked me into being associate dean. Um, and then after that, you know, people keep asking you if you keep producing. Um, so um, what's interesting about it is that every single role other than chair, they put me in as acting first. So essentially I had to prove that I could be the associate dean of the School of Business despite being a designer and illustrator. Um, I had to be, I was acting associate provost um, before I became an associate provost. So um, sometimes you have to prove yourself in ways that you didn't necessarily want to, especially when you didn't ask for the job in the first place. Um, but again, that's, that's moving that dial. Um, and one of the things that I always thought was important was to show them what and how designers think um, and how useful that is within everything. Um, so I think in a very systems-based way, a very user-centered way. Um, and if we think about our tenure and promotion documents that way, can we help our faculty be, to be more successful um, and to make it easier for them in that process? Um, and that's what really ended up getting me sucked in is I kept asking those questions and saying, can't we do it this way? And they would say, Allison, that makes too much sense. And I would say that's impossible. Um, but essentially that mean be, meant be quiet for now, you know, be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. And so then I would go back and I would take the documents and I'd redo them and I'd bring them back. Um, and then I would show them to everybody and they would say, oh yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Um, so you have to have confidence in your own skills, but it definitely have, helps to have a mentor who's willing to, to take a chance on you and to tell you that you have the ability to do these, these things. Um, and I'm not sure that design faculty do that regularly because they haven't necessarily stepped outside of their design role uh, or faculty role. Um, and it's hard to do that. Um, so it's really hard. You lose a lot of your own practice uh, and it becomes the practice of the college. Uh, and so it's really hard, I think, especially for designers uh, to lose that time and space to, to do that kind of work. Um, but I think also this fact that conferences have been so um, often difficult, right? Difficult for grad students to come to, difficult for undergrads. If you have to travel, there's the costs associated. You know, the AIGA and the DEC work really hard to keep those costs reasonable. Um, usually the cost to attend a, a DEC conference is pretty low, but the AIGA is not necessarily. And then if you talk about something like how or or even some of the other academic institutions. I went to a conference for HCIL, so Human Computer Interaction. It was like $1,500 just to register and attend so I could speak and give my paper plus travel to the place. And so it was, uh, I think a lot of that stuff is so prohibitive for a lot of um, scholars and academics and students to be able to engage with. And so these virtual spaces have, I think, been a really beautiful godsend. It's not the same. It's not the same as if I were in the room with the four of you, you know, the same room with the four of you. But at the same time, none of you had to travel to New Hampshire um, to come have this conversation either. So I think this does point to a lot of opportunities that kind of break down some of those barriers that have sort of been present. Um, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind right now. You know, about conferences, I mean, we, we touched on how conferences are a machine that's been created in many ways to, to feed tenure. And, um, but it, it's sort of unconscionable 
where where faculty are not fully supported to attend conferences i mean you you know it's sort of like i mean one of the benchmarks could be for tenure is that you faculty have to achieve a national and international presence and can you imagine what that is like on a faculty you you know a junior faculty whose salary is 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 so small and then and then you know and then the institution is like you know it can be like yeah i mean you know a cheap conference would be six hundred dollars registration then you have flight accommodation per diem i mean it's just nonsense it's just nonsense in a way i suppose faculty are paying for their tenure which is which is absurd and that needs to stop and i commend um deck you know for for providing uh you know that kind of proper and then in the the covid sorry i've had too much coffee but in the covid 19 world the conferences are still asking the same registration cost to do it virtually i mean it's like insane right? the lunatics are certainly you know controlling the asylum well, I'm we're also going to have to contend with the fact that uh, universities and colleges are not going to have the finances to send anybody anywhere for quite some time. Um, all of our funding has been pulled back, not that anybody's traveling anyway, but even when it opens up, the institutions aren't going to have the money to do it because they're taking huge financial hits um, right now. So that's one of the easiest things to to cut. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that then rolls uh, into the effect that that has on, on junior faculty and tenure. That's a great you know, thing, Alison, uh, that you, you mentioned. And it's sort of like this thing that you know, junior faculty, when they came, you know, there was an agreement. And you know, this is a British thing, but the goalposts have moved. And how does that impact their tenure track or their timeline? Because for many people, they can't do the same kinds of research. And I'm sure the expectations and the money is gone and the expectations are still the same. Well, that, that was one of the questions that was on the list, right? Is that should, you know, if you have the extension or if you're offered the extension, should you just take it automatically? Um, and that's why I think it, it, it becomes a case by case basis. And this is where we sort of come full circle, right? Like you need mentorship, you need support, people who can help you make those decisions. Um, and, and I want to say too about conferences specifically, like I would say that, that tenure feels like a financial commit. It's also like a financial commitment because it is very, like when I think about all of the all of the money that has gone towards conferences specifically. Um, I guess the, the upside though, of course, is that I've, that's where I've made a lot of my connections. And certainly, and I would add like the DEC conferences were sort of a godsend to me um, in terms of, of beginning to, to, to build my own network. Um, I, I would also say too that, well, and you know, CAA, I, I was, at the CAA conference in February, which feels like 50 years ago now. <laughs> and, and the number of people that I knew and talked to there was, it was wonderful. Um, but yeah, it comes at a, at a financial, there's this financial piece to it. But I would also say, it, it seems to me that in other disciplines, grad students, undergrads, they're, they're already starting to go to conferences. Like they're, in terms of learning how to do research and figuring out those trajectories, those are happening at even at the undergraduate level and certainly in the graduate level. And that's one area that, that I did, that, that's one way in which I feel like I was delayed, right? Because I didn't have that preparation. And I do think it's important. I do think it's great even for students, undergrads to attend a conference or two, just to get an idea of what happens at them. Um, but yeah, there are, you know, speaking of barriers again, like that, that becomes a, a big one. So. Uh, 
uh, how will these virtual conferences count? Uh, will it will it be the same? And if you put that on your CV, how will that look to um, administration? You know, how carefully are you going to have to explain that distinction? Is there a distinction? Um, so I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about either one of those. You know, thinking about what is peer review, what counts as peer review, especially in terms of conferences, um, and then what about all these virtual conferences? Um, so I don't know if anybody has any thoughts. So I think that everybody is so focused on how they're going to reopen right now that there's been very little thought of that from the administrative ranks. Um, so just the lift of what format classes are gonna be in multiple formats, how we're doing that. So I don't think there's a lot of thinking going on around that, but um, if I put that hat on, um, one of the things that I always say also in terms of administrators is that we were, most of us, faculty, right? And the thing I always tried to do was put my faculty hat on um, and think about how everything that I was involved in was affecting them. Now, I can't say that every administrator does that, but they do remember what it is to present at a conference and they do understand that conferences are going forward and as long as that peer review process is going on in the conference setting, I think that it will still count. So if it's the same organization that's behind it, the same jury process, there's no reason for it not to count. That's my opinion in terms of what I think is going to be happening, but that's, that's how I would move forward, assuming. If new conferences pop up and there's no peer review and it's a new format, then it's, it's an entirely different beast that we have to deal with. Um, and I'm all for forcing institutions to try to grapple with where those things go. Uh, but again, that's one of those things you wanna do probably after you have tenure. Uh, you wanna help junior faculty and stay in touch with what's going on and try to help push that, that forward after you attend. I just wanna talk about, just note about peer review um, and maybe the difference in an ideal world, the difference between peer review and review for say, getting into a group exhibition or even getting a grant. Um, though some grants do a little bit of this, so there's a difference between peer review the conferences it's often a kind of yes or no so it acts like a gate like kind of a barrier right and so this is one of these things where i think because we use the same term it and it means different things in different contexts it can be really confusing for newer faculty so at a conference it kind of acts like a gate and you know they're like um burn said like there might be thirty thousand and two hundred yet published you know 200 papers from that conference yep published or whatever. But in, I mean, to me, the ideal way that peer review um, is used, and it really, um, it acts as free feedback. So for example, if you're thinking about publishing an article, or the journals ha are starting to become a little bit more inclusive about other formats of publishing, um, ideally, I would say peer review is not about that gate, right? Instead, it's about providing you free feedback, which is very hard to get these days, right? And free feedback from people who have some expertise in your field um, or in the specific area that you're working on in your scholarship. And um, I'm part, you know, we're, we're kind of updating our peer review rubrics and a discussion around peer review and design incubation to hopefully make that clearer and reflect that more. Because I think as we think about all these different ways of helping people get seats at the table and mentorship. It's really about meeting people where they're at and recognizing that our MFA programs, that our educational system is not really designed to produce people going through a tenure process at um, state and public institutions that are not art schools, right? That's not a celebration of making. Um, and so peer review can really help with that as long as it's couched in the terms in, of, you know, we're really trying to help you get to this next Hope you get up this rung, and um, I hope that those of you who are watching, uh, you know, will sort of think about engaging in peer review with that spirit. That, is, that peer review should be the most generous, not necessarily allowing everybody in, but in terms of feedback, and and that feedback should be part of peer review whenever possible.
value, how do we talk to our institutions about the value of what we're doing? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so I was actually going to ask about that. I mean, I think like design incubation, CAA, AIGA, I mean, I feel like those organizations, I mean, I'm referencing them. I mean, would you, I guess my, my question to those of you who have served in, in administrative capacities, like, is it helpful to reference these organizations or institutions as a way of saying, here, here are some, for lack of a better language, talking points that you can use in your tenure materials with your respective institution to talk about your work? Yes. <laughs> um, I think one of the things, and maybe this can also be a slide, is that I think the best um, sort of, if you're thinking about a criteria for moving through the tenure process um, that you're trying to maybe present to your department or to your institution to help them, to help frame the work you're doing, I think right now the most robust one is at CAA. And it was done by, uh, it was sort of spearheaded by Karma Gorman at UT. Um, and I think it would be, I try and reference that in, in every presentation I give, honestly, be, just to get the word out. Um, I screenshot that and put that in presentations that have nothing to do with tenure and promotion if I know that there's going to be faculty on this tenure clock there, because it is very inclusive. And it does, CAA is a long standing institution. It also is an institution that many, faculty in the arts understand the value of. And so if you're in a department as one or two graphic designers or communication designers and everybody's sculpture or these other fields, like they will understand CAA. And so maybe there can be a slide sort of screenshotting that because it's really helpful to be able to point outside of the institution to a larger professional organization. Um, I would be a little bit careful in your documents of uh, that go beyond your department of listing things like AIGA and DEC and CAA and, uh, and explaining to people beyond your department what these institutions are. Again, incredibly briefly, succinct. What is this? Why is it important? Why are we paying attention to the work that you're doing with them, uh, to the things that you're presenting to the department? Um, and I think Eris's point about CAA is really important while I align much more with AIGA than anything I ever had at CAA. If you're at a college that has the rest of the arts, it's going to speak a lot louder to them. I'm in a department that only has graphic design, so uh, AIGA mattered more. Uh, but know that about your, your own institution when you're doing that. I saw that later down on the list of questions was a question about, you know, do you, if you have, if you're tenure track and you have the option of extending, do you take it or, or not? So I'll just like quickly say, I mean, it depends on how far in you are along your trajectory. And it really, I mean, it's really a, an institution dependent kind of question. Um, it is, I think it's just depends on your specific case, what institution you're at how they, you know, all these other questions we've talked about, what they recognize as scholarship, how does that translate into like the COVID-19 reality? Um, but I mean. I'll, I'll just add lastly, first of all, it's been wonderful just having this conversation with all of you and just to be reminded yet again that I'm part of the, a larger community and that that people do I feel like design is an area where we do want to support one another so that's really been helpful um, and just this idea of, of like being in a tenure track can feel very overwhelming but I think it's helpful to have these conversations and remind myself that this is doable lots of other people have gone through this process and that there are these structures and resources and people in place to reach out to when in doubt. Well, and I would give a shout out to the DEC design um, research resources as well. Uh, so it's a really handy page that is a good place to get started. Uh, if you've never really thought about it too much, it's a really in-depth resource. Yeah. 
I think we need to focus on on helping and supporting each other. And I think DEC, uh, DC is is a really good uh, vehicle for that. A sort of organisation that has heart. Um, and the other thing I would say, you know, to people who are listening in on this is the first priority is to keep safe. You know, these are going to be difficult times for all of us and it's not going to end anytime soon. All the research data is that, you know, this is going to be a long, around for a long time and uh, just focus on uh, reaching out to people, mentors, uh, family members that can give you the emotional and academic support through this time. Yeah, so something that occurs to me is just, um, first of all, I applaud um, the DEC. I'll, I'm sh I know from putting on events that there's a ton of work in the background, whether we're in virtual or physical space. And as we transition into virtual space, sometimes more because we're, tr you know, we had a playbook that we can't just hit rewind play for. Um, but so I thank, I thank everybody, you know, not just on this call, but everybody who continues to stay engaged in creating opportunities for us to have these discussions. I know for me, it's like, it's like, I leave discussions like this being really inspired and empowered and always feeling like I've learned a lot, even, you know, if I'm a panelist or an attendee, either way, um, you know, we can get kind of siloed in our own institutions and really just feel like, you know, I'm worried about the signage in, that's going to be in this hallway or whatever and doing what Bernard said and trying to stay safe. Um, but it's great to kind of go back out to the larger view and to be able to have some more substantive conversations with colleagues because I think that that's what keeps us all excited and engaged with design incubation. And to just sort of add to what Burton said about um, keeping safe, I would say it's not just keeping safe, but also what Anne suggested in terms of, you know, when the plane is going down, you put your mask on first. Um, you know, the, you need to, we, we all, especially for untenured faculty, um, there's a, and it's also for those who are not on the tenure track, there's a tremendous load being put on in terms of teaching and preparation and administrative work. And um, please all put your own masks on first. And I'm going to try and remember to do that too, because I, you know, we all have a tendency to give. And I have that tendency as well, but I can only give more in the future if um, I'm still able to do that, right? So yeah, um, really, really thankful to have been included with this group. Oh, thanks everyone. And uh, as Anne said, big shout out to Design Incubation as well. You all are doing phenomenal work through all of all of this as well. So um, okay. I've I've just I'm so impressed with everything that your organization does. Um, and then also, Burn had uh, mentioned um, you know making sure that we welcome all the people who are coming to us from community colleges and high schools um, and all sorts of different venues all the teachers out there who are teaching adjunct and still trying to keep a design practice together bless you because <laughs> i know that that is a lot of just incredible work and there's a lot of um just a lot of um sort of fear right now around your job security and how everything is going to to go forward so but thank you again all all four of you it really means so much to the dec to me um to all of our audience members that you took the time um, on this Friday. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day out here at least to uh, have this conversation.